perspective on grief, a perspective on negative events, learned and gleaned from the Torah portion. The Torah portion tells us of a horrific event. The two oldest sons of Aaron made an error, a calculated error, as to how to deal with the revelation of God at the tabernacle, which served as the temple during not only the 40 years of the travels from Egypt, 39 years from Egypt to Canaan, to the land of Israel, but for another 369 years, the tabernacle, or the, at least the covering of the tabernacle and the artifacts in the tabernacle were those that were found in the, um, the tabernacle of Shiloh, Shiloh, the building, the temple at Shiloh. Now that was for 369 years and 14 years. The tabernacle served as the, as the holy place in Gilgal. So for 383 plus 39 years, the tabernacle was it. That's a total of 422 years, longer than any one of the two temples stood. And at the day of the dedication of the tabernacle, Nadav and Avihu, the two oldest sons of Aaron, offered incense, incense at a time when it wasn't necessary, when it wasn't called for. And because they decided on their own what to serve God with in such a holy place at such a holy time, they were dealt with very harshly and they died. Of course, the Zohar says they died in rapture. They're, the reason why they died was because since this was not by God's command, it was totally voluntary, there was no break upon their rapture, and they died in their rapture. This is not what God wanted. Hence, there was never a commandment for this. Had there been a commandment, they would not have died. But since there was no commandment, it was totally voluntary, this triggered a spiritual yearning which was left unchecked. And in the process of that yearning, the souls expired. But it was tragic, tragic for Aaron. The day, imagine, the day that you're installed as the first high priest, the day in which your progeny become the priests forever. Kohanim have to be the children of Aaron. Son after son, can't be from a daughter, can't be from a cousin or a brother or even a brother, even Moses. None of Moses' children were Kohanim, were priests. And there's a question whether Moses himself was a priest, but none of his children who were born before him were considered priests. So the day that you're installed as the priest, the only priest, the only priestly family, that's the day your two oldest sons, the pride and joy of the Aaron family, the greatest of the great, souls that reflected the soul of Adam. That's what it says in the writings of the Ari. They were the reincarnations of Adam himself. Such were their great heights, and they died imagine the blow, the psychological destruction, the frustration, the anger, the pain, the suffering. Imagine what Aaron's wife was going through. She's seeing her husband installed as Kohen Gadol, and the two oldest children die so suddenly, without warning. 
And yet the Torah says something that's striking. Take them away. Bury them without any great fanfare and don't stop the service. Why? When a Kohen loses a child or a loved one, Kohen is supposed to sit shiva, not the Kohen Gadol. Kohen Gadol can't sit shiva. But even the Kohen Gadol has to rend his garments to some extent. Even the Kohen Gadol is prohibited from eating of the sacrificial meat on the day that his loved one dies. Why were they told? Like, shoo it away. Don't focus on it. Focus only on the surface. And the answer is very simple. When you're dealing with a public happening of this magnitude, you cannot stop the private pain, private suffering. It was the greatness for Klal Yisrael, for the Jewish people. We had once again become affirmed as God's chosen ones by virtue of the service in the tabernacle and later in the temple. God's presence was palpable and revealed in the tabernacle and would never depart. Such an event that identified the people of Israel as God's chosen ones, God's children, such greatness, such grandeur, such wonderful news for the community, the enthusiasm therein should not be doused and cooled off by personal tragedy, no matter how profound. The Belzer Rebbe, previous Belzer Rebbe, Rabbi Aaron, Rakeach Zechet Sadek Midroch, was not just a holy man. He would have been a holy man if he had lived in the time of the Prophet Samuel, or if he had lived even during the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. He was a true holy man, a true tzaddik had 10 children and over a hundred grandchildren. He survived the Holocaust and not a single one of his progeny survived. The only one that survived from the House of Bells besides himself was his youngest brother, the Bilgeray Erov, Nochem. The Bilgeray Erov, he told him, I'm too old you must marry, you must continue on. He married, he had one son, and 18 months after he married, he died. The son never knew his father, only knew his uncle for the first few years of his life, till so his uncle died in the 50s. The son, that son, Visachar Ver, Visachar Dev, the Keich is the present Belzadeva. Ud Mutsal Me'esh. A piece of wood. A single piece of wood, a single shard of wood, saved from the fire. And yet look what he's done. He's created bells. Reconstructed bells to a glory that it hadn't seen in generations. The Bells of Shul in Yerushalayim is the largest synagogue in the world, or at least for Orthodox Jews. And the Bells of community has grown 10, 20, 30 times as much over the last several decades, all on account of the leadership of Rabbi Sachado. But what was Rabaran thinking? What did the Belzeru of himself think? 
in the recesses of his mind during the painful time after the war? And the answer is nothing. The Belzerov focused only on reconstructing cloudy soil. He had been saved for a purpose greater than himself, and he wasn't going to wallow in self-pity when he had to save Klaudisro, whatever he could. Previous Lubavitch Rebbe lost his daughter, Shana. His middle daughter would have no children. His oldest daughter had one child who never had any children of his own. The Rebbe, knowing the way these things work, probably understood that the trade-off for saving himself was that he would have no progeny left. And yet he did so with an incredible enthusiasm. He did so with a gusto, with a, with a devotion that was unparalleled. His job was to save or to help save American Jewry from total assimilation. There was no time for self-pity, no time for the pain and suffering over the, the thousands of Qasidim that were murdered and the tens of thousands that were lost and for the millions of Jews who were so horribly, horribly dealt with by the Nazis. There was no time for that. He had a focus on American Jewry and saving America's Jews. Such is the nature of the lesson of the Torah of this week's portion. When events appear to be negative, we can't focus on the negativity. We have to focus upon what is it that we're supposed to do right now Right now, there's no time for mourning. Right now, there's no time for suffering. I say this in reaction to the events that surround us. Anti-Semitic actions, anti-Semitic attacks are on the rise throughout the entire world. It's very troubling. Middle of the day, Jewish people are attacked openly, publicly. The Obama administration refused to acknowledge this. They made us worry about Islamophobia, but in truth, 60 to 70 percent of the hate crimes in America, while they were preaching Islamophobia was terrible, 60 to 70 percent of all hate crimes were against Jewish people. So one could wallow in sadness, despair. One could go ahead and look at Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with their anti-Jewish bend supporting BDS. It is clear that today's anti-Semites are only anti-Israel. They're not anti-Semitic. It's not cool to be anti-Semite. But those who want Israel to disappear from the face of the earth want to kill all the Jews. That's a fact. There's no difference between Ilan Omar's anti-Semitism and that of the KKK or the, the white supremacists or the neo-Nazis. They have no difference because the Mufti, the Mufti, the uncle of Arafat, the, I'm sorry, the Mufti is the uncle of Hussein, King Hussein. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was an ally of Hitler during World War II, as were all of his relatives. They preached the killing of all Jews, wherever they might be, especially in the Holy Land. So what Omar and Harilk want 
is the death of all Jews. But it's just not PC. So they say they're not anti-Semites. They're just anti-Israel. But it means the same thing. So one could become disheartened, more anti-Semitism, more hatred of Jewish people, more jealousy, more accusations, more attacks. But you have to see the great picture. Israel is on the verge of not just becoming a major player in high tech, it's on the verge of becoming the major player in high tech. The electric eye, and it's called, I forgot what, what it's called, the mobile eye, the computing um, dynamo that will allow for driverless automobiles is centered in Israel, founded by an Iraqi Jew. A team of Israeli scientists claim that they are on the verge of breaking through and creating cures for cancer for all forms of cancer. Now, this is just a claim that people are poo-pooing it. But they wouldn't make that ludicrous claim if they didn't believe in their theory. And I wouldn't bet against them, just as I wouldn't bet against the Jews landing on the moon. They already have. And Israel is self-sufficient in terms of energy. No wonder that Saudi Arabia has decided if you can't beat them, join them. They can't destroy Israel. They can't destroy Israel by cutting off its oil supply because Israel has its own gas and oil, enough for at least 400 years. Israel is an energy producer, exporter of energy. How about that? Israel is at the forefront of every major technological breakthrough. So we can't wallow in our sadness and grief. We have to look at the big picture. The big picture is Israel is becoming stronger. That means the Jewish people are becoming stronger. Israel's number of Torah students is increasing. That means the Jewish people are becoming more learned. The more there are Haredim, the more there are religious people, religious Zionists, who soon will be the majority of the country. The religious plus the traditionalist means that Israel is becoming more and more traditional to following the ways of the Torah. Israel is growing economically, culturally, religiously, and importance in the world. And Israel has the capacity to now make peace with the Arabs on its own terms. That is the miracle that God has given the Jewish people of our generation. And therefore, we cannot be saddened by individual events. We have to look at the big picture. We have to focus on what's next and what our challenges for the next moment, rather than wallow in the pain of the last moment. Yes, an individual has to sit shiva but not the community. As a community, we have to be positive and enthusiastic, even with the death of Nadav and Abihu.